Today I want to make um, a center punch and a few other kind of handy tools and I thought why not take this opportunity literally um, I don't know to show you what is the bare minimum you're going to require to be able to become like to start as a hobby uh, this whole blacksmithing thing um, what's the bare minimum materials you're going to need and literally this is basically it this is all you're going to require and of course you're going to have to acquire some skill as well and some knowledge too but this is all you're going to need uh, to start doing some blacksmithing Ooh, that's nice and refreshing because this is a hairdryer that has also apart from the hot setting has a cold setting and that's what you want you want a cold setting so that it doesn't overheat when you're using it for your blacksmith because you're gonna have this on maybe uh, several hours at a time sometimes you don't want to turn it off and you don't want a hot setting because it's just gonna melt away next thing we're gonna need is just an ordinary pipe don't have it galvanized that's highly poisonous uh, you can die from it so just use a normal uh, mild steel pipe no coating no 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 plating nothing like that on it and just cut some slots in it you can use your Hacksaw if you're mad enough or ask a friend with an angle grinder to do it for you Also, you're going to need a set of blacksmith tongs and this could be the first project that you're going to make now in my last video uh, The video before this one. I basically just made them from this um, High tensile bar you could use mild steel anything like that and literally You don't even need a set of tongs to make a set of tongs. You're going to need an anvil so just an old a sledgehammer head stuck in the ground. I'll show you that now in a minute. You need a piece of waste of steel and in this case I'm using this um, this spring. It's high carbon steel so it's very very hard stuff. We're gonna need some wood or coal or charcoal or something like that. Just ordinary wood works fine. No problems whatsoever. I, I have even managed to do forge welding and I'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, how to do that. There's a little trick I, I want to share with you when using only firewood. Now, last but not least, whoop, hey, that would have looked cool. Hang on, there we go. <laughs> now, last but not least, a shovel to dig a hole. Right, All right and there you have it. Now I'm just going to quickly set up the anvil, also shouldn't take too long. Okay, so two things, first of all, in order to get the fire hard enough to do forge welding, I promise I was going to mention that, what you got to do for that is you got to let the fire just burn naturally without any air supply. Do that for about 10 minutes, just keep feeding the fire slowly. It'll allow it to actually build up embers. And what I found is when I then actually turn the air supply back on, I have sufficient amount of embers to be able to do the forge weld. I've built up those embers and you need a lot of embers to be able to get enough heat. Um, to do forge welding uh, which is cool because it means you can actually use wood as your source of fuel now this wood is slightly wet as well you can see stuff coming out of there it's ideal to have dry wood if you're going to try and do forge welding now next step is going to be take my hacksaw and I'm going to cut myself a little piece off here it's probably going to take me 20 minutes with a hacksaw and that's kind of all I got so let's get started on that I don't need you to watch me cut this now for the next 20 minutes. So let's just get started and I'll see you in a sec. So, that's it now. We have a nice round piece. So what I've done is I've went away and got myself this uh, leaf spring. Um, it's pretty much the same kind of thing. That's for the front wheels, this is for the, the back wheels made pretty much out of the same steel really hard stuff probably make a good machete at some point but I'm gonna use that little ring in there now to actually 
straighten this piece out. Okay, that kind of worked. All right, so I went away and I got myself uh, my other set of um, tongs and I also brought these pliers just in case um, because these are actually made for light flat stock. Those are made for heavy round. I have nothing in between. I still gotta make myself a set. But for the time being anyway, we can actually play with this because I mean, just take a look at this. Now this is how red uh, you really want this to be. I think I'm just going to use this and what I'm going to do is I'm going to flatten out this end so I can actually grip it all right now I should be able to grab it with this pair of tongs this set of tongs more easily which it does work so that's good That's pretty straight now. And literally all I want to be doing now is trying to get that tip hot so I can turn it into a punch. Shouting. So what I've done now, I've put the tool actually just into the fire. I'm gonna call it the night or day. You can see it's gotten way too dark and the tool is not where I want it. I like to make tools and I, I like to make them as best as I can. And because it was getting dark, it wasn't getting there. So I can just stick it in the sand there and that would prevent it from cooling down ah, too fast. And tomorrow I'll dig it up again. There we go. So there we are. Oh, so that was a lot of fun actually. Um, just using pretty much the most basic tools. Not that many. Okay, I did use angle grinder, but you could also use a rasp and make the steel hot and rasp it. It's nearly as fast as an angle grinder. Um, yeah, so I had a lot of fun just doing this out here. It's a different feeling. I actually prefer this than doing it on the forge for some reason. So, that's it, gonna clean up and get out of here. Okay, so it's the next day, basically. Um, last night it got dark really, really fast and I managed to, um, I was rushing the kind of shaping of the tool, I wasn't happy with it and I even managed to heat treat it to harden it um, and even one tempering cycle. I also normalized it three times, which I'll explain a little bit later in this video. But I, as I said, I wasn't happy with it. So I decided to come back today and we'll just go from there. I even put a point on it, um, but I'm, I'm just gonna do a bit more forging. Also, I'm going to take this stump, because this was sand, it didn't really work. I'm gonna take that stump out and I'm just gonna use it as is on the flat which should make my life a little bit easier here. with the point it's looking pretty good it's got the, the correct taper as well um, now the next step is going to be trying to clean up the back there and then we can look at hardening Wow. 
one more little final adjustment just there all right so that's what it basically looks like now um, I'm way happy with the actual shape of it now before I'm going to do any kind of cleaning up on the actual piece itself um, uh, before I'm going to do the hardening and the, the heat treating which I'll explain now in a minute I'm going to actually, I'm going to have to normalize this, which means I'm going to have to heat it up to cherry uh, red, so a bright red kind of roughly, and that's where a magnet won't stick to it. So it's, you know, you, when you put a magnet to it, it won't stick, and that's how you know you're at the right temperature. It's all the same temperature you're going to be using for hardening the steel uh, later on. Now, once I've done that, I'm going to let it air cool three times and what that then eventually will do is, once I've done that, it'll kind of relax the steel back into its normal state. So the steel wants to be at a certain state and because it has been a spring and because it also has been hammered a lot and bent and all this kind of stuff, um, we want to actually take all that memory out of it and the best way to do that is to do normalizing and don't forget yesterday I also annealed it as well. So that's by putting it into sand and letting it cool down even slower than the air cooling. And so you get a nice relaxed piece of steel. So that's what I'm going to do. Just quickly want to show you another punch I made. This is a slot punch. Um, it's also quite a nice punch. For making hammer heads and axe heads you can make the eye where the actual hammer handle goes into. One last thing I want to mention as well. This is something you want to add to your toolbox as well because you can literally do the, the, the hardness test, which we'll see now in a minute, but you can also do a thing called hot rasping, and you can actually make a point on this. Providing the steel is uh, nice and hot, you can take way more material off than if you were doing this cold. And if you don't have an angle grinder, that's the way to go. But you, might, you may need uh, a vise or something like that, or just lean it onto your anvil at an angle and just go for it. Okay, let me just normalize that. I'll get back to you when I'm done. Okay, so we have our normalization done now three times. And it's quite hard to see actually because with the direct sunlight, it can fool you. But having a magnet on hand is actually handy too. Okay, now what we want to do, I should have done that, now I'm getting smoke into my face. We want to start cleaning this up using the angle grinder. Okay, so there we go. Our center punch is nicely done. Um, and we have it right there in the middle as well where we want it. You can see that, but it's always hard with the reflection of the metal to, to kind of show it properly. But. Um, it's gonna do the job really really well I'm very happy with it now now the next step is we're gonna put it into the fire bring this up to a, a non-magnetic state and then we can quench it and that'll because it's within like half a second uh, goes below a certain temperature it turns it into a very very hard but brittle steel it's a bit like the a bit like a file. A file, you can actually snap that, you can break that very easily. I could throw this on the ground and it would actually break. Because it's extremely hard steel, it has been hardened, but it becomes brittle. And then we have to do a thing called tempering to take away that brittleness, but make it tough. And I'll show you all that now in a second. So let's just stick it in the fire and try and get it up to the proper heat. I also have this or a tin of water and I can actually quench it in oil, in brine and in just water and this steel, this spring steel gets really really hard if you, if you quench it I found in water and because it's not a blade it won't crack as easily if I quench it in water it'll get really really hard if this was like a machete or something I may actually quench it in oil which makes it cool down a little bit slower and just slow enough that it doesn't actually crack. Okay, I'm just gonna go up and down really quickly and shake it around a little bit. And the reason I'm doing that is for two reasons. One is, if you just put it in without doing this, what will happen is it'll make a, um, a kind of a, a coat of steam around the actual steel 
and that can affect the whole uh, hardening process. I don't actually, I'm not sure exactly what it does and why it's bad. Surely somebody will know. I'm new to blacksmithing, as you know. Um, now, the second reason is you don't want a quench line to form where the actual um, grain structure is different from the actual steel below than above because that could be a weak spot where it can actually crack. And now once the temperature has gone out of the, the bit above, so it can't harden anymore, I'm, I stuck it all the way in very quickly. And uh, what that does is it basically, it cools it down, but it cools it down. <coughs> Whew. Sorry, the smoke is really getting at me there at the moment, so it's hard to focus. Let me just bring you somewhere else. Oh. Wow. Oh, man, my eyes are tearing up. Anyway, so I just stuck it into the quench. So I heated it up to here to about... Um, Actually, I, I like heating it up to about orange and then sticking it into the water. And that gives it a real hard uh, steel. So if I drop this now, this probably would snap. Now, what I then did is I quenched it once the color was gone out of here and it, it went below the non-magnetic state, I could actually put it into the water and just cool it all down uh, without fear of the rest of this actually hardening. Because I, I only want this bit to hard, be hard and the rest needs to be able to absorb a lot of that shock. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to test for hardness. I hope this all makes sense. And it should actually skate off. Which it doesn't sound like it's doing at all. Well, actually it is. Can you, feel, can you hear the difference? So it's biting in there. And this is Rockwell 62, so it's really, really hard. Whereas there it's skating off. So we, we've actually managed to harden this now to a, a good enough state where it's at least uh, around the 60 mark, which is really, really, really hard. So the next step now is we need to soften this now up again. So, but not make it as soft as this point, but soft enough that when we, when we drop this, that it's not going to break because it's still brittle. We don't want it to be like a file. We want it to actually punch stuff, punch holes. So the best way to do that is we're going to clean this up to a shiny state to be able to see a thing called the temper colors. And the temper colors are an ind indicator of what temperature the steel is at. So for instance a, a light brown, which is what we want here at the tip, is going to be around 250 degrees Celsius, 400 and something degrees Fahrenheit. Whereas the blue, which we want around here and the purples down here, they are way higher, like 600, 700, 800 degrees Fahrenheit, I'm not entirely sure. And that means that this point will be a little bit harder than this point, but soft enough that it won't break when we... Um, so we're softening it up. That's what we're doing when we're doing the tempering. So let's just quickly do the tempering, and I'll show you how that's done as well. Yeah, let's just clean that quickly. Okay, you can see that the temper color is starting to run. We have a bronze starting there at the bottom, you know, where the black meets the silver. And uh, that's really, really good. Uh, it's running away now. At some point, we're going to have to rest it. Um, what we're actually doing here is we're differentially hardening and differentially tempering this tool. Oh, we're nearly there now. You see that? It's getting brown. And that's the color we want. We want it to be uh, bronze or brown at the tip. So straw color or um, even bronze would be fine. It'll be a little bit softer. Now, one thing I mustn't do is quench this end because it'll become brittle because we'll be hardening it. What we're trying to do is we're, we're differentially, we've hardened, differentially hardened it. So the tip is hard, this is soft. And now we're differentially quench, um, tempering it as well. As the heat rises, um, the least amount of heat will be here. And the most amount of heat will be down here. And this is basically how you harden and temper uh, a tool like this. 
So we, we have dark bronx here, light bronx here. So it's still not there. It's quite a thick piece of st uh, steel. I might stick it back in the fire. I just wanted to mention that so you know what's going on. Oh okay, yeah, I just took it out of the, f the fire because I started seeing purples here. I don't know if it's showing on the camera. Um, it's showing bronx to about here and straw here now which is not showing, I can see it on the screen, it's not showing on the camera. The camera picks up the silvery more than the actual uh, browning. But I'm going to have to quench this now, just to make sure we are at the right temperature. Okay. Now, that was the third time I actually did this. I didn't show it the first two times, there was no point. And literally all I did was, I um, basically cleaned it up now, uh, getting rid of the browns and everything. Because underneath this, by like a, a micron of steel, when you take it away, you literally are back to silver. And you can then see the, uh, the, the colors run again. In fact, because there's still a lot of heat in this end, I'm letting it cool. What you probably could do is clean this end and see if it might actually run again from the heat source that's down here. <laughs> I don't know, there's always something about a fire. It's like the Stone Age, Stone Age TV. That's what I like to call it because literally you can watch it for hours at a time. Now that concludes the video. Here are four, I actually made five tools since I started becoming a blacksmith. This one was today's. And the other one, which was also a punch, is over there, still working. It was the first tool I ever made and it was made out of mild steel, so it, it obviously bent. And there's a lot to be said for making uh, tools out of the proper steel. Now, I wanted to show these to you because I think there's a lot of... Um, we're losing our appreciation. This is what I found. One of the biggest lessons I found doing this blacksmithing is how much I actually uh, lost my appreciation for just items. Now when you make it yourself, this is one of the first tools I made, I still, I still appreciate it. I, and I know for a fact if I had bought this, I probably would not appreciate it as much anymore. If I had known the person who had made it, probably I would appreciate it a little bit more. But I don't know, it's just, and it's all made from waste, which I, I get a thrill from, I don't know why, but somehow I do. So that's it, concludes the video. Uh, literally within half an hour you can actually become a blacksmith, build a blacksmith, uh, what they call a blacksmith shop. And that's it. From stuff that you probably have in your basement, you know, somewhere in the tool shed, you probably find all these things. And yeah, so do let me know what you thought about the video. It's always nice to get feedback and other than that, and um, thanks for watching and hope to see you in the next one as well.